All right, let's talk about special issues in closely held businesses. First, let's talk about special issues in closely held corporations. Actually, the issues are the same for all closely held businesses, whether they are corporations, partnerships, or LLCs, but the law of these different business organizations might deal with these issues differently. So first, let's talk about uh, special issues in closely held corporations. There are two main categories of special issues in closely held corporations. First, the scope of fiduciary duties. And secondly, the transfer of ownership interest, the transfer of shares. Can shareholders transfer their ownership interest? Scope of fiduciary duties in the closely held business, the same fiduciary duties that we've already talked about with respect to directors and officers apply in the closely held business. So we have the same fiduciary duties of care, loyalty, good faith, duty not to commit waste, etc. cetera. Uh, there is also a special duty, and a lot of people don't like to call it a fiduciary duty. Sometimes I'll slip up and I will call it a fiduciary duty, but just think of it as a special duty of good faith and fair dealing between the shareholders, right? It doesn't matter whether you're a director or officer, it's a special fiduciary duty of uh, shareholder to shareholder. And once again, I already slipped up and said fiduciary duty. Think of it as a duty of good faith and fair dealing from one shareholder to another. With respect to the transfer of shares, in a closely held business, you might not want your co-shareholder to be able to transfer her shares to a third party. Imagine this, you've entered into a closely held business, a closely held corporation with two other shareholders. Why have you entered into a business uh, with them? If they were just to provide money, then it's no big deal if they transfer their shares to a third party in most cases. Right? But usually you have entered into this business with these two other shareholders for reasons. They might have some important skills that are crucial to the business of the corporation, or they might have other soft skills that are crucial to the operation of the closely held corporation and to the corporation's business. Indeed, you might have just entered into this uh, uh, closely held corporation with them as co-shareholders because they're easy to get along with. They're your friends. So you don't want them transferring your, their shares to a third party who might not bring the same skill set and might cause problems for you. So you might want to prevent the transfer of shares to third parties without your consent. Um, you might want uh, to allow transfer of shares to third parties, but you might want to have certain conditions on those transfers. And finally, in a closely held business, there is really no market for your shares. You might be lucky and you might find some third party that is willing to purchase your shares. But generally, there's no market for the shares out there. My stock in a publicly held company, if I want to sell it, it's just easy. I just go to my broker and say sell and I have sold my shares. And so I can exit my investment at any time. I can cash out my investment at any time. If you are in a closely held business, closely held corporation in this case, your shares might be freely transferable, but who are you going to transfer them to? So you might want to use a shareholder's agreement to create some liquidity, to create a means for you to exit your investment. And that often means that the corporation will buy back your shares or the other shareholders will buy back your shares. So uh, that's the, those are the issues with respect to the transfers of shares in the closely held corporation and really in any closely held business, regardless of uh, organizational type. All right, let's talk about fiduciary duties in the closely held corporation. As I already mentioned, directors and officers have the same fiduciary duty of loyalty, care, and good faith. Now, remember, you're going to have a closely held business and your shareholders are probably going to be acting as the directors and officers. So uh, you have these duties of loyalty, care, and good faith. Of course, the duties not to commit waste, etc. Same fiduciary duties we talked about, but it's going to be applied to the shareholders 
uh, in their capacity as directors and officers. <clears throat> we also have this special duty of good faith and fair dealing between the shareholders. So one shareholder to another. Shareholders owe each other a duty of good faith and fair dealing in the closely held business only. What does this mean? Well, when will you be acting uh, without good faith and not in fair dealing? What we're looking for is you as a shareholder, you're exercising some sort of discretion or control. Now, this discretion or control may be given to you through corporate law, right? There are certain things as a shareholder that you get to do. You get to vote a certain way. You get to uh, maybe call a special meeting, something like that. You're exercising control uh, as a shareholder. Now, this control or discretion might be given to you uh, by the shareholder agreement. So the shareholder agreement might give you some sort of veto rights. You have to exercise that control or that discretion in good faith. Uh, finally, your control or discretion might come from your position as a director or officer in the corporation, right? You're a shareholder, you have been able to elect yourself to the board of directors, and therefore, you have some sort of control or discretion over the corporation. Or maybe you're one of the executive officers uh, also. Then you have a certain amount of control or discretion over the corporation. You as a shareholder are required to exercise this control or discretion in good faith and fair dealing naturally. So what does it mean to exercise control or discretion not in good faith? Well, the red flag for bad faith or not good faith is where your discretion transfers wealth to yourself uh, at the expense of the other shareholders. So somehow your decision uh, affects the other shareholders negatively and affects you positively. Now, that doesn't mean you've acted in bad faith. You are allowed to use that discretion as a shareholder to benefit yourself. We're gonna vote, I'm gonna vote, I'm gonna vote myself to the board of directors. That's good for me and bad for you because now you're not on the board of directors. Or I might vote for a dividend and I want a dividend and you don't want a dividend. So if I vote to, uh, for the corporation to uh, issue a dividend, I've benefited myself and I've hurt you. I'm allowed to do that, right? The question is, have I done that in bad faith? So when I benefit by my decision, my act of discretion, my act of control, and you suffer from it, that doesn't mean I've acted in bad faith. That just means it raises a red flag about bad faith and we have to look into it a little bit more carefully. All right, what are the contexts that we normally see these happening? Well, we might expel or fire another shareholder. Remember, we probably all have jobs uh, with the corporation. We're all executive officers and we're all drawing salaries. Maybe two of us get together and fire that third shareholder. That raises the issue of us acting in good faith and with fair dealing. Um, dividends. I've already given a basic example of this. I want the corporation to issue a dividend. You don't for whatever reason. We have different tax brackets. We have different tax burdens. The corporation issues a dividend and I'm happy, you're unhappy. That's okay, but this is the situation that we might want to ask, why did I vote to issue a dividend? Or why did you vote to not issue a dividend? Um, purchase of my uh, co-shareholders shares. The shareholder agreement might give me a right to purchase your shares uh, at a very good price for me uh, if, for example, you are fired from the corporation. And so when I am purchasing your shares at this low price, have I done anything to cause you, to force you to sell out to me? If I have, then we wanna ask ourselves, did I act in good faith and with fair dealing to you? So these are the three basic fact patterns that you're going to be exposed to.
All right, so we're talking about the good, the duty of good faith and fair dealing in the closely held business, in the closely held corporation, duty of good faith and fair dealing between the shareholders of a closely held corporation. Duty of good faith and fair dealing. You might want to think of it as a duty not to freeze out your co-shareholders. What does it mean to freeze them out? Well, to freeze them out means to deny them of their reasonable expectations uh, in the business. Deny them their reasonable expectations to their rights and benefits as shareholders. The problem with traditional fiduciary duty law is that uh, most of these decisions that are being analyzed under this good faith and fair dealing are decisions that under traditional fiduciary duty law would be subject to the business judgment rule. Uh, let's take a look at how that might work. All right, so here's our first example. Imagine we have shareholders A, B, C, and D in a closely held corporation. And shareholders A, B, C, and D, they get together, they pool their uh, collective resources, collective control, collective discretion, and they terminate the employment of shareholder D. Now, under traditional fiduciary duty law, how would this look? Well, if you fire someone, it's as your, uh, uh, in your capacity as a director or officer of the corporation. So shareholders A, B, and C are directors or officers of the corporation, and they use their capacity as director and or officer to fire shareholder D. Have they breached their fiduciary duties? Well, you would see, we just apply the business judgment rule. The decision to terminate an employee is just a business decision, and therefore it would be subject to the business judgment rule. Shareholders A, B, and C would be protected under traditional fiduciary duty law, and shareholder D would have no cause of action against shareholders A, B, and C for terminating his employment. Now, for what reasons might we not want to defer to the board of directors and the executive officers in this situation? Why might not we want to uh, defer to this type of business judgment? And it has to do with the realities of a closely held business. When you look at the realities of a closely held business, this decision to terminate shareholder D is a little bit more suspect. So what are the realities of a closely held business? Well, the first reality is that shareholders often receive their return in the form of salary. And so if they are fired, they lose that salary and they're losing their reasonable expectation as a shareholder to receive their return. Um, the second uh, uh, reality in a closely held business is that if one shareholder is fired from her job, then there's one less salary to pay. One less salary to pay means that the other shareholders benefit from that. The other shareholders uh, save money and benefit from having this uh, uh, expense. Now, if it was a real job and you have to hire someone else to, f to fill that job, then maybe the other shareholders don't receive a benefit. But clearly, shareholder D, who has been terminated, loses that benefit. And that benefit might represent his benefit as a shareholder, the, the right to receive uh, the residual. Let's look at another example. Imagine shareholder A has a controlling interest in XYZ Corp. And she uses that control to cause the directors to decide to not issue a dividend to the shareholders uh, this year. This is good for shareholder A. Shareholder A naturally likes this decision, but the minority shareholders are unhappy about this decision. Maybe the shareholders, the minority shareholders need that cash to pay personal expenses, or maybe they need that cash to pay the tax they owe on the pass through taxation in an S Corp, for example. How do traditional fiduciary duty laws uh, deal with this situation? Well, the decision to issue a dividend or to not issue a dividend is a business decision, and therefore it is protected by the business judgment rule. But why might we decide that the court should take a little bit more care in uh, uh, scrutinizing 
this decision by the board of directors. Well, the realities of a closely held corporation maybe tell us that we should take a second look at this decision and we should not immediately uh, protect this decision with the business judgment rule. What are the realities of the closely held corporation? Well, in a closely held corporation, there are no market for the shares. So the only way for the shareholders to realize a return on their investment in the corporation is through those dividends or, of course, through employment with the corporation. So let's just look at how I would realize my uh, a return on my investment in a public company. So imagine I've I have shares in P&G, and P&G decides not to issue a dividend to the shareholders this year. Well, if I need the cash, I simply sell my P&G shares on the market. I just send a note to my broker, sell, and I sell, and then I have the cash I need. But if I am a shareholder in a closely held corporation, there is no market for my shares. I can't sell these shares to just anyone. People don't want to uh, purchase shares in a closely held corporation. And therefore, when the corporation decides not to issue a dividend, there's no real way for me to realize the return on my investment. Uh, that doesn't mean, however, that the decision by shareholder A was made in bad faith. Right? Shareholder A made this decision. Now, maybe shareholder A made this decision because it, shareholder A felt that this was best for the corporation. Retaining the earnings and reinvesting it in the business was best for the corporation. Or maybe shareholder A said, listen, I don't need the money. And if uh, this corporation issues this money to me, uh, it won't do me any good. So there's no point in issuing a dividend. So this is the best decision maybe for the corporation, or maybe it's the best decision for shareholder A. Shareholder A is allowed to use her control to uh, vote in a way that uh, uh, realizes her best interest, as are the minority shareholders. If the minority shareholders had had control, they might vote in a way that would uh, maximize their interest. They might have voted for a dividend and that wouldn't have been good for shareholder A. So the question is not whether one shareholder was hurt and another shareholder was benefited. The question is whether the shareholder who benefited, benefited used her control uh, in bad faith. Now let's kind of think of a situation, a fact pattern where shareholder A is acting in bad faith. Maybe shareholder A said, listen, I'm tired of these minority shareholders and I'd like to buy them out, but I want to buy them out at a very low price. So I want to create an advantageous negotiating position for myself. I know the shareholders need cash. If I withhold the dividend to them, they need that cash, they need it quickly, they're gonna to wanna to sell their shares. And the only person who's gonna buy their shares is me. And so now, because they are in need of the cash, they are going to be uh, in a bad bargaining position. And I'm gonna be able to bargain a very low price from them. In this situation, we might conclude that shareholder A has exercised her discretion in bad faith. All right, so once again, let's talk about what exactly a freeze out is. Remember, what we're looking for is where a shareholder uses her discretion or control to freeze out other shareholders. What is a freeze out? Well, denying the shareholder of her reasonable expectations to profit or to control or some other right. Um, what reasonable expectations do shareholders in a closely held business have? Well, this is a matter of fact, and we have to look at the express agreements between the parties. So for example, imagine I'm a shareholder in this closely held business 
And we all agree that we will all have a job with the closely held corporation, the closely held business. Well then, we have an express agreement and not only do I have my traditional rights as a shareholder, but I have a reasonable expectation to a job with the corporation. Um, there may be implicit understandings between the parties. Um, we also need to determine that if one shareholder exercises the discretion and denies the other shareholder of a reasonable expectation, did the shareholder exercising control benefit at the expense of the other shareholder? Why do we want to ask this? Well, this is a proxy for bad faith. Now, it doesn't mean that this is bad faith, but it is a proxy for bad faith. This is the, the fact situation that we're going to look at and say, hmm, maybe the shareholder exercising control acted in bad faith. Her decision caused herself to benefit at the expense of her co-shareholder. Maybe she acted in bad faith, but not necessarily. Now we're going to talk about remedies for breaches of fiduciary duties in the context of the closely held corporation. We're going to make a comparison between traditional remedies for breaches of fiduciary, fiduciary duties and special remedies for breaches of fiduciary duties in the closely held corporation context. The traditional remedy for breaches of fiduciary duties is that the recovery goes to the corporation. So, for example, imagine I am a director of a corporation and I engage in self-dealing with the corporation. Let's say I sell a plot of land to the corporation and I make a cool $10,000 profit by selling that piece of land to the corporation. Let's also imagine that uh, it turns out that this is a breach of my fiduciary duty of loyalty. If a shareholder sues me and now I am found liable for a breach of my fiduciary duty, that $10,000 profit that I must pay as a remedy goes to the corporation. So the damages that I must pay for breaches of my fiduciary duties are disgorgement of the profit to the corporation. So that payment goes to the corporation. Now, imagine the same situation in a closely held corporation. I'm a controlling shareholder. I'm also a director of the corporation. I engage in self-dealing with the corporation by selling a plot of land to the corporation, and I make a cool $10,000 profit in breach of my fiduciary duty of loyalty. If the remedy, if the remedy is for me to pay the corporation that $10,000, well, remember, I'm in control of the corporation. I'm the controlling shareholder. So if the corporation gets that $10,000, it's like I received that $10,000. I am in control of that $10,000. So you can see why in the context of closely held corporations, courts might fashion a different remedy. Um, sometimes the court will say, well, the recovery should go to the aggrieved shareholders the uh, controlling shareholder has abused her position of control and has harmed the corporation. Instead of making the uh, uh, recovery, instead of requiring the breaching controlling shareholder to pay the corporation, will require the breaching controlling shareholder to make some sort of payment to the aggrieved shareholders. Uh, an alternate remedy would be equal treatment or me too treatment for the aggrieved shareholders, for the minority shareholders. So in the case of the situation where the controlling shareholder engaged in self-dealing with the corporation by selling a plot of land to the corporation and making a $10,000 profit, instead of requiring the controlling shareholder to either pay the corporation that $10,000 as a remedy, or to pay the, the minority shareholders that money as a remedy, the court might say that the corporation now has to issue a pro rata amount, pay a pro rata amount to the minority shareholders. We'll call this Me Too treatment. Uh, the idea of this Me Too treatment is that the money that the controlling shareholder received for breaching her fiduciary duties was 
a disguised dividend. So the $10,000 that the controlling share, the $10,000 profit that the controlling shareholder made in that self-dealing transaction was really a disguised dividend of $10,000. And the minority shareholders are now entitled to a dividend themselves. They might not be entitled to $10,000, but they'd be entitled to their uh, a pro rata amount of that $10,000 in proportion to their shareholdings. Uh, finally, a court might use an involuntary dissolution statute to force the controlling shareholder to buy out the minority shareholders. You can imagine if you're a minority shareholder and the controlling shareholder is repeatedly and systematically breaching her fiduciary duties, you might say, you know what, I've had enough of this. I don't want recovery. I don't want me too treatment. What I want is to get out of this situation. And so I want to force the controlling shareholder to buy me out. Uh, a court might find that it has the power to force the controlling shareholder to buy out the minority shareholder through the involuntary dissolution statute in most corporate law statutes. Let's talk about that in more detail now. All right, so a minority shareholder who feels that the controlling shareholder is engaged in oppression, is oppressing the minority shareholder or engaged or acting in an illegal or unlawful manner, might ask the court for involuntary dissolution. So in our situation, we're thinking of a minority shareholder in a closely held corporation that feels that the, cor uh, the controlling shareholder is engaged in oppression. What do we mean by oppression? We mean that the controlling shareholder is using her control in little ways and maybe in large ways to deny the minority shareholders of their reasonable expectations, maybe their voting rights, maybe their rights to dividends. Uh, it could be a lot of things. So if a minority shareholder in a closely held corporation can make the argument that the controlling shareholder is engaged in a systematic uh, series of uh, breaches of fiduciary duties, the court might say that this is oppressive conduct, it is illegal conduct, it is unlawful conduct under the involuntary dissolution statute, and the court might grant involuntary dissolution at the request of the minority shareholders. The problem is, is that the minority shareholders really don't want involuntary dissolution. Why? Because involuntary dissolution results in liquidation. What that means is, is that the corporation would sell off its assets, uh, meet its obligations, and then what's ever left over will be distributed to all the shareholders, including the minority shareholders. The minority shareholders would not really want this remedy. Why? Because a liquidation usually does not result in the going concern value of the corporation. We're liquidating the assets, uh, we're meeting our obligations, and what's left over is just really book value or actually liquidation value. It is not looking at the corporation as a going concern. Remember, the value of the corporation and the value of my shareholdings in the corporation is based on the ability of the corporation to make profits in the future. If we dissolve the corporation, then it has no profits in the future, and all we're getting is that low liquidation value. What the minority shareholders really want is they want the minority shareholders to buy them out. They want the minority shareholder to buy, excuse me, they want the majority shareholder to buy out the minority shareholders at fair market value, at going concern value, which is higher than the liquidation value. Most involuntary dissolution statutes don't expressly provide for this remedy, but some courts have said, listen, if I can, uh, if I have the authority to, uh, uh, to, dissolve the corporation, which is an extreme remedy, then I can fashion a less extreme remedy. And theoretically, a less extreme remedy would be requiring the majority shareholder to buy out the minority shareholder. You might question that reasoning. That might seem like a more extreme uh, uh, remedy than dissolution. But in any cases, some courts have done this. Now, even if a court is unwilling to do this, the minority shareholder can use the threat 
of involuntary dissolution as a negotiating tool, as a bargaining chip to get the majority shareholder to buy her out. So if I'm the majority shareholder and I feel the majority shareholder is engaged in oppression and I have a good case, I can say to the minor, uh, majority shareholder, listen, I am going to file for involuntary dissolution unless you buy me out at fair market value. And the majority shareholder probably doesn't want the corporation to be dissolved. Um, so that's how uh, involuntary dissolution can play a role in the remedies a court might fashion or in the solution that the parties may come to in a case where the majority shareholder is engaged in systematic breaches of fiduciary duties, is engaged in uh, oppression of the minority shareholders.